Did you know we can change the world through the power of our intention? This is Robert Ranney, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is new physics expert, Lynn McTaggart. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California, Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and on UK Health Radio all weekend long. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, we're entering the interview portion of our show, and let me start out with just a couple of thoughts. Uh, Often it feels like we live in a world um, of competition and limiting beliefs. You do this and you get that, or maybe somebody else will. Very competitive. We're taught that things take so long to happen, but it doesn't say how, it doesn't have to be that way, actually. Today, we're going to talk about infinite possibilities, tapping into the true nature of ourselves, about limitless possibilities that are available to all of us that transcend our limiting beliefs, and about what can be and how long things take to happen. They don't have to take that long, people. Today, Guys Guys Radio welcomes the world-renowned journalist, metaphysical teacher, and expert on consciousness and new physics, Lynn McTaggart. It Lynn's with, with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about Lynn. Um, let's see. One of the central authorities on the new science and consciousness, award-winning author of seven books, including The Field, The Bond, The Intention Experiment, Power of Eight, also co-founder of the international magazine, What Doctors Don't Tell You, which I'd love to learn about because I've, I've visited enough of them, and the architect of Intention Experiments, a web-based global laboratory to test the power of intention to heal the world. And Lynn also hosts her own podcast, which I've listened to called Living the New Science Podcast. Lynn is a highly sought after public speaker, consistently listed as, as one of the most spiritual influential people in the world. And I'm so thrilled and honored to welcome Lynn McTaggart to Guys Guys Radio. Hello there, Lynn. Welcome. Hi, it's great to be here with you and all your guys, too. <laughs> well, we have a lot of gals also, but thank you so much. Uh, just so everybody knows who's listening, there's a little bit of a, a gap uh, between us in terms of uh, hearing because of an internet connection, but it's all good and we'll get through it and it, it'll sound fine. So let's start at the beginning. Um, the Field is your seminal book. Um, people seem to think that um, everybody's an individual. We had uh, we had Newtonian kind of a perspective. We had the Dharmans perspective. So we had separation, competition, but it doesn't really have to be that way. And you came across the field. Your background is a journalist. And I'm wondering what inspired you to go down this path to talk about consciousness and really to teach people that it doesn't have to be the way they think it's been. Well, I got very interested in why spiritual healing works. Um, I have a magazine with my husband called What Doctors Don't Tell You. It's been running now for 33 years. Uh, it started out life as a newsletter and then became a magazine. And we're both investigative journalists at heart. And so we study a lot of the science about medicine, what works and what doesn't, mostly what doesn't work in conventional medicine and what does work and has evidence for it in alternative medicine. So in the course of researching that publication, I kept coming across very good studies of spiritual healing. And I kept thinking to myself, wait a minute, if you can have a thought and send it to somebody else and make them better, that completely undermines everything we think about how the world works. So I decided to try to find out why. I thought I might be looking for something like human energy fields. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I convinced my publisher to let me go on this journey without a compass. What I discovered in talking to <clears throat> some scientists who were doing a lot of work in consciousness research were that each of them had discovered a tiny bit of what compounded into a completely new science, a new view of the world that had nothing to do with individuality. That wasn't about competitive individualism. This was much more about how we are all part of this giant quantum energy field. 
and that many of the things that we think about the way the world works are not true, that we and everything else out there are energy and also thoughts are things that affect other things. They're trespassers. And so as I started researching that, and that became my book, The Field, there was a little bit of unfinished business, Robert. And it was all about this whole idea that thoughts are things that affect other things. So as I mentioned to you, I'm a skeptical journo at heart. So I wanted to figure out, well, how far we can take this. Because there was a lot coming out at the time about manifestation and law of attraction. And the big skeptic inside me said, okay, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about curing cancer with our thoughts? Or are we talking about a very tiny shift in a quantum particle? So that became my next book, The Intention Experiment, which was also an invitation for people to take part in giant intention experiments that I began setting up with scientists working at prestigious universities like Princeton or University of Arizona or University of California, et cetera, Penn State, and inviting my readers around the world. And there were lots of them by then. My books were in 30 languages to take part in these ongoing experiments by doing intentions together. So that's how I got into this whole thing with both feet. And I guess I've never left the subject. I've followed each new trail and it's led me somewhere else. Well, it, I think you're leading us to where, you know, people talk about ascension and a big change. And I think your books and your teachings are kind of leading us along and have been leading us along that path. So thank you and, and congratulations. So to just kind of level set for our, our listeners, some may be familiar with your work and the whole notion of the field and others may not. So I wanna make sure everybody kind of gets this the basic and then we can get into the more practical aspects of it. So most people think that, you know, we're a body and we're separate from everybody else. There's a universe around us, but we're filled with billions of uh, microbes. I know for myself, I, every day I say, all those billions of microbes in my body, I love you. And my body feels great then. So I know there's an interconnection there and I am made up of these billions of particles. Now, the energy then is there's the aura and then there's a whole energy field that's out there. And most people think and have been taught that they're little tiny particles that are separate from each other. But uh, your notion is, and the field is that it's, and it's based on science that quantumly it's a, it's a flow. It's everything's interconnected. So everything keeps changing, but you know, there's the entanglement where two twins can be across the country and one breaks his leg and the other one breaks his leg. Also, there's a lot of that stuff going on. So it's not about separation. It's more about connectedness. Help me, Lynn. Okay. Well, think about the nethermost level of your being. We are all made of subatomic particles. And these subatomic particles aren't little billiard balls like we've been told in chemistry class and you know other classes in physics classes. They're actually vibrating packets of energy. They're sending energy back and forth with each other like an endless game of tennis. In that process, they create what's called a virtual particle. And that's there for far less than the blink of an eye. But what it does do when you think about all of the little tennis games going on between all the subatomic particles in all the things in all the world is it creates a field. And that's what we're talking about with this quantum field. Now, this is so energy dense, this field between all of these subatomic tennis games that if you were sitting one yard away from me, the energy between us would be enough to boil all the oceans of the world. You know, it has more power in it than the nucleus of an atom. And of course, that's where we got the atomic bomb from. So it's got so much energy density. But there are two really important points about a quantum energy field. Number one, we're part of it. A lot of people say to me, uh, how do I enter the field? And I say, you don't need a pass. You're already there. You're in the field. You are the field. You're part of the field. But two, th two other things. Number one, 
subatomic particles are also waves. When they bump into each other, they take on their information. They also have an infinite capacity of to hold and store information. If we were to put the Library of Congress, which holds every book in the English language, on a, a quantum wave, that whole library would fit onto a sugar cube sized wave. That's how amazing they are in terms of holding energy. So in one sense, that field is like a giant library of Congress of everything that ever was. It's an information source, infinite information source of everything that ever was. But also it gives us a mechanism, a matrix for how everything is connected. Subatomic particles go on essentially to infinity. And so if they're all part of this giant web, things are or interconnected and it explains how we can access information beyond our senses. So does that mean that every, everything, because people talk about manifestation all the time, everything's already there, the past, present, and future there in this field, and you can tap into that and, and um, find, it, find it there? I or would is that, say is, that, is that a separate and, subject? That's a big separate subject. Okay. I think the past and the present are there. I don't think the future is there. I don't think the future is predetermined. I think the future... Well, it's a long conversation about what time is and that right. time essentially doesn't exist. Right. To put it in a sentence, time is one big smeared out now. Okay. The zero point energy is another concept uh, that's proven uh, scientifically that is part of the field. What exactly is that? It sounds like that's kind of the space between all of these moving particles uh, is is that correct, or am I am I on the right track there? Or is it something a little bit different, a little more complex than that? It's it's a little different. It's all about temperature. Um, it's the same thing I described. This what I described as the quantum field is the zero point field. The reason it's called zero point, and as you absolutely rightly say, scientists have known about this since the advent of of quantum physics. It's called zero point because these particles still move and have their little tennis games, even in uh, temperatures approaching absolute zero, where everything is supposed to slow down and nothing is supposed to move. And because of that little constant movement, this, this field continues to get created and scientists really get irritated by it because it messes up their equations. Trust me, but when because of this constant moving, they can't make tidy little neat equations because of the zero point field. So believe it or not, they subtract it out. To me, that's a little bit like subtracting out God. The whole purpose, the whole mechanism, the whole underlying matrix of the universe is being subtracted out by scientists. But as you rightly said in the very beginning of our conversation, this is a matrix that connects us all. It indicates that we are not separate things. We're not separate and well-behaved things as described by Newtonian science. We are all vibrating packets of energy, trading energy back and forth, and inextricably involved in this field. Amazing. Uh, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio, Lynn McTaggart. We're talking about the field and uh, other books of hers. Let's get into the next one. The The bond came out of the, the field. That was the next one. And it's kind of about um, the connectedness versus the competitive dysfunctional culture that we live in. And I've always thought this on my own. Like, why are we, why does it have to be this or that? Why does it have to be a winner and a loser? Why can't we all win? Everybody's at their best, we all win. But every aspect of our life is built on competition. And it's always seemed to me to be very dysfunctional and unnecessary. Tell us about how you uh, made the move, if you will, from the, the field to the bond and what the bond's all about. Okay, I had an intermediate step in there, which was my next book after the field was The Intention Experiment, okay, which was okay. all okay. about testing 
the power of intention. And we can get back to that shortly. But with okay. the bond, as you say, I really wanted to answer, was Darwin right? And it came about because I watched a, a daughter of ours who is um, very good in, um, in drama get elbowed out by another girl. And I was shocked to see this because this other girl who lied to take over the position my daughter had in, in this play was her best friend. And I tried to bring it up to her mother and her mother just shrugged and just said, well, that's life, isn't it? And I was horrified by that notion. I started thinking, yeah, that's the life we adults have created for ourselves, but were we meant to be like that? And so I looked at all of the science and it's very clear we were never meant to be so individualistic and competitive. We do much better <clears throat> when we belong, when we share. You know, human beings need community and they need belonging, essentially more than they need to eat. We need to give, we need to take turns. We were made essentially to be much more connected. Now, I'm not talking about socialism. I'm, I'm, I live in the UK, which has dabbled in socialism and I can see a lot of the, the problems of that. But it, what I'm talking about is we are meant to be much more connected and not dog eat dog. Darwin was wrong. The new science demonstrates that we, everybody does better when we are much more connected, when we are not so competitive. And again, I'm not against capitalism, but I am against naked claw capitalism. I think we've gone down the wrong path and we are starting to eat our own children with it. Yeah, it's it's predatory now. And a couple of things that are dysfunctional about how we live taken to the extreme, when you have some of these authoritarian, authoritarian types getting into power, what happens is, you know, you have a 51%, that's your majority. So that's it. The 49% are completely ignored, whichever side you're on. And that is so dysfunctional and so unfair and so wrong. And it creates more decisiveness. On the flip side of that, Lynn, you've got people say, well, competition mm -hmm. is healthy, healthy competition. Um, it, that's how we strive. That's how we get ahead. That's how records are broken. That's how our discoveries are made. That's how creativity can work. Just competing, even if you're competing with yourself. What's your response to that, Lynn? Okay. I think competition on the sports field is really great, but when they've looked at real competitiveness, let's say in a company, a big company, and they did look at this in several of the big tech companies. And a, a friend of mine, Jack Canfield, who is a, an advisor to some of these big companies, said that he went to one and the whole staff were put in separate silos and made to compete against the other silos. And it inhibited innovation compared to some of the other ones where people were working as a team, they were connected together, and the whole team had a, a sense of group achievement. And so there's that and many, many other examples that we don't necessarily have to be competing, crushing the competition in order to get ahead and to innovate. We, of course, need incentive but it doesn't have to be at somebody else's expense. That's the problem. I think we need competition to all do the best in something, to all say, okay, who's got the best idea or who's going to come up with a way to create greener energy? Who's going to create something that is also going to work for everyone else and also do we need to, uh, to place so much money in the hands of just a few people and so much um, power in the hands of just a few people? Okay, let's look at Amazon. That was built as a competitive business. Right. It's almost crushed the book business, my business, you know, or one of the businesses mm -hmm. I'm involved in. 
it's taking over the marketplace of so many other things. Uh, I don't know where antitrust laws are are with when it comes to Amazon, but they should wake up and smell the coffee here because so many other companies are, you know, are being eroded and 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 destroyed by that ability to just gobble up and take over everything. Yeah. So I I think it's got to be a much more sophisticated capitalism. How about this? How about rewarding the good? You know, we've talked many times, my husband and I, about a stock market that rewards companies for doing good, not just doing, not just making money. Now, if you had a completely other plan, a completely other demonstration of, you know, of worthiness, other than just making money for shareholders, you'd come up with a completely different world, essentially. So again, I'm not against some healthy competition, but I think that we have to rethink all of this. And it's also, I think, very, very negative for men too, to always think that they've got to get out there and elbow out the other guy. I think this is a really bad concept for men now. I, I agree completely with everything you just said. I'll, I'll give you an example, a Jack Canfield example. I worked in the brand and marketing and advertising. I was president of an ad agency in New York, and I've been at the biggest agencies and boutique, very creative boutique, successful companies. And and they all have a different culture. And the best culture I was in uh, was, a, I'll, I'll say the name of the uh, agency, Margiotis Fertitta Partners. It's not around anymore. It was sold off and people went their separate ways. However, the leader of the agency, George Fertitta, my boss, he set an environment where everybody enjoyed coming to work. I never thought about it as work. It wasn't my highest paying job. We did the best work. I was happy. Everybody, there was no conflict. Uh, you know, there was healthy competition a little bit, but it's almost like I can do it. No, I can do it type of thing. It wasn't, if I do it, you can't do it. And yet I worked at another agency, another yes. smaller agency, and I came in there and I saw it happening. Everybody was boom, boom, shooting at each other from behind their desks and in their offices. And the work was pretty good, but it was toxic and it was a miserable place to be. And I made a lot more money there, but you know, money isn't everything you need it, but it's not everything. So I think that's point one. The second point you mentioned about men, we uh, men compete with each other just in how we interact on a day-to-day -day basis. There's always a little jibe. There's always a one-upmanship. You have to be very careful about um, revealing anything of a personal uh, nature, of feelings, of emotion. It's tough to be a guy. It, it really is because we don't have places to go to where sometimes I find at least women, they'll sit around, they'll talk about stuff that's happening in their lives. We talk about sports. I mean, from, I, mean I can't talk for every man, but we talk about sports. If there's something big like I'm getting a divorce, that comes up. Otherwise, you, you don't get into other guys' stuff unless you want to hear them out. They want to talk about their work, their job or something. But they don't even want your input. They just want to talk about it. So it's, uh, I think men are in a really tough spot nowadays. And it doesn't have to be there that way because, to me, this is a time where men have been never been more free to be whoever they want to be yet it's never been less clear who they really are. What do you think, Lynn? Oh, that is so totally it. And I am really against, I mean, I'm very happy the Me Too um, situation arose because, you know, when I was a young woman, I, I was a young journalist and there was, somebody came on to me with every story I did, at least one. And usually it was most of, my interviewees, and they didn't take me seriously. You know, it was kind of this, um, this, it was kind of a frivolous thing with me in this tape recorder. They didn't take it seriously, which was rather good for me as an investigative reporter, but you had to go with all of that. So it's good in terms of the real abuse that um, women have suffered, you know, the Harvey Weinstein stuff. Sure. But it's it's become almost it's become terrible to be a man to be anything masculine is being attacked et cetera et cetera. I agree with you. I think it's very hard to be a guy, and 
I think it's very hard because guys aren't encouraged to emote. Uh, you know, they're not allowed to emote and they don't have that kind of social interaction, as you say. Where I do see it is in our power of eight groups where, mm -hmm. and we can talk about that, yes, but I yes. see when people meet in a group week after week after week, they start opening up to each other and it becomes a blueprint for men as well. That's fantastic. My special guest on Guys Guys Radio, the amazing Lynn McTaggart, her book here for those on YouTube, The Field, the seminal book, uh, one of many. Um, I just want to clarify one thing. When I talk about, you know, it's tough to be a guy. Listen, men have kind of ruled things uh, for the past thousand years or so, and women have not gotten a fair shake for a thousand years. And it's long overdue that they're getting long overdue recognition. So a lot of the guys' issues they have brought upon themselves. Still, it's tough to be a guy nowadays because they're not sure what their role is supposed to be. Women are on a more straight trajectory towards achievement and recognition. Men are like, what do I do now? What, am, what is expected of me? And then they don't have anybody to speak to about it, talk to. And so it makes it tough. So I just wanted to, to say that. Um, Lynn, no, I agree. And I totally agree with everything, everything with that. And it must be very confusing because let's let's be honest, people get together as couples because a guy will make some sort of overture to a woman. Now he must be terrified to do that. And you know, back when I was a young woman, if you didn't want that advance, you didn't claim somebody was abusing you. You just simply said, no, thank you, and knew how to do that. So it is, it's gone a little too far. But I think what's maybe opening up now, and I'm seeing it in my our daughter's partners, is the ability to talk more openly, to connect more with children, to take on um, childcare roles. Mm -hmm. I see that with my son-in-law, with our, our first grandchild recently. And I think that's great because I think, you know, the humanness has to extend to both sexes. Absolutely. And guys do have to have an outlet to be able to speak and connect and interact. Absolutely. Let's, let's talk about, you mentioned intention before, and it's so important because it comes out of a, it comes out of the field and we have the tension and then the bond. Um, talk to us about attention. What, what is that? Why is it so important? And how, what is your, pers how is your perspective different? What do we need to know about that? Okay. Well, intention is a focused thought. And as I said, from my work on the field and then my next book after that, the intention experiment, there's a vast body of scientific evidence showing that thoughts are not only things things, but things that affect other things, everything from single-celled organisms to full-fledged human beings, and computers, everything. So I tested that with these experiments that I ran uh, since 2007. I've run 40 of these experiments with a variety of scientists in all of those prestigious universities, Penn State and Princeton, et cetera, et cetera. And of those 40, which were everything from trying to make seeds grow past faster to purifying water um, by one or more pHs, uh, to lowering violence in areas, to healing someone of post-traumatic stress, of those 40, 36 have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects as measured by these scientists at these prestigious universities. So there's no drug out there with that consistent track record. Now, what I've done since then is, and about 2008 I started doing this, is shrink the whole process down because with intention experiments, I've had up to 25,000 people all coming on my website or some platform and sending intention all at the same time, the same intention to the same target. And that's how we ran them. But I shrunk it down so that people were in small groups. And my big interest was group intention. What happens when people are intending at the same time? Does it supersize the effect? And the answer, the short answer is yeah, it does. It does hugely. 
So since 2008, I've been putting people in groups of eight or so, having them send intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. And we've seen thousands of healings. And by healings, I mean not just health healings, but also healings of finance, of careers, people finding new and exciting careers, relationships, even life purpose. I've had two people get up out of their wheelchairs. I have it on video. Uh, one woman paralyzed with idiopathic paralysis that came and went from her neck down. Another woman with multiple sclerosis uh, who pushed away her wheelchair after one 10 minute group intention and stage four cancer and all kinds of things. And as I said, I've seen groups help other people, people within their groups to manifest new love in their life or to make their relationships go better with their husbands or to get over sugar addictions. Or I've had a couple of people who are going blind and it's they've regained their sight and more and more and more. So I want to emphasize, I am not a healer. I don't, I don't put hands on people. I don't do that. What I do is just show people how to get into a group and the group does it. And the group has loads of different reasons why it works so well. Um, there is a group effect. Um, when people get together, it kind of creates collective effervescence, as one psychologist put it. Um, there is the power of intention. It definitely works. It seems to be, you know, in, enhanced by group effects. And there's altruism. That's a big piece of my work. When people do things for other people, the science is really clear, Robert. They live longer, healthier, happier lives. There's no question. And then the other big piece here is oneness. So as I watched all of this healing going on over the years, and it took me 10 years to write the Power of Eight book to get the courage to write it because I couldn't understand this. And so I wasn't, I didn't believe it. <clears throat> and I needed to understand it before publishing that book. So we did brainwave studies with a team of neuroscientists from Life University, which is the biggest chiropractic university in the world. And we found using student, uh, student volunteers, seven groups of student volunteers, putting an EEG cap on one member of each group mm -hmm. that very quickly, parts of the brain that make us feel separate. So that's the parietal lobes. They sit right here and also, the right frontal lobe involved in worry, doubt, negativity, they were all dialing way down. So instead of enhancing more brain waves as you do in meditation, this was turning off those brain waves. These were people whose brain wave signatures were almost identical to those of um, studied by Andrew Newberg, a neuroscientist at the University of Pennsylvania who had studied uh, Sufi masters during chanting and Buddhist monks during ecstatic prayer. So these were people in a state of, a, essentially a state of ecstatic oneness. And that happens very, very quickly in these power of eight groups. People talk about feeling unbearable heat or uh, goosebumps up and down their bodies or crying uncontrollably. There's all kinds of things that happen or just feeling a lot of heat in between and a lot of energy. And it people go into essentially like a mystical state. And I think that oneness, that feeling of oneness that we don't experience normally in our lives, you know, we, we experience life in separation. You know, we're lonely people on a lonely planet in a lonely universe, but we finally experience what it's like to be in the field in this group intention experience. And I think that's one of the one of the reasons for all of these things happening, all of these miracles, so-called miracles happening. Just absolutely amazing. Um, 
two questions here. One is why why did you choose the number eight? And secondly, what can people do on their own? Uh, we we want to urge them to check out your website and uh, enter you know, join a power of eight group. Um, but what can they do on their own? Because many times people try to, you know, you can work with plants, you can work with water. I just heard a study about water where somebody was asking the water to give them a message and they froze the water and they took the water out of the freezer and it had their initials on there. <laughs> it's like really over, over the top. But we can very good. That everything's part of the, the source. So what can people do individually to work on themselves and also connect with everything? thinking that I guess everything is divine. So we should be able to connect with everything and communicate with everything energetically. If everything's all waves and we're all connected in that big soup that way. Okay. So one thing they can do right away is try doing intention with two pots of plants, uh, put some seeds in a pot and do intention for one of it to grow and just focus on one and just see if they send intention, I want you to grow um, five inches in the next three months or something like that, very yeah. specific, and watch and see what happens. Um, on a more practical level, I would say if I were going to give um, suggestions of what people should do with intention, I teach 13 keys to intention mastery. So it's a, a whole big course of mine. And I've got a big one that starts in February. That's my year long masterclass. It's called the power of eight intention masterclass, where I actually put people into groups after teaching them and work with them for a whole year. Um, so if they wanted to just get started with intention, one thing I would suggest they do is tell the universe what exactly you want. Be specific. Don't say, I want a million dollars. Say, my intention is that I receive $2,553, if that's what you need, in three months or whatever it is. Give it real specificity. That would be my one suggestion. But my second suggestion would be join a group. Now, people can join it by just joining my website, lynnmctaggart.com, okay. and going to my community site and just saying, hey, I'm in this time zone. Anybody want to join a group with me? And <clears throat> these groups work just as well virtually. You don't need to be in person. Now, eight came about by accident. I was just kicking around the idea back in 2008. How do I shrink this down? Put people in groups. So I was just kicking it around with my husband, Brian, and, and our team. And I said, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll put them in groups of eight or so and have them send intention to someone with a health challenge. That was the plan for our first workshop in this area. And my husband's a great headline writer. He's a journalist, too. And he said, I love it. The power of eight. And that's how it got started. <laughs> it's very media. It's a very great media line. It's for, it's perfect. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be eight. It can be six. It can mm -hmm. be twelve. But eight is a nice Goldilocks figure, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of meaning for people. It's a sideways uh, infinity sign. Uh, it means good luck in Chinese, etc. People like eight, but it doesn't have to be exactly eight. It just needs to be a, a group. Well, let me um, ask you of a small size for you personally uh over your journey if you will and you're kind of in mid-course doing this wonderful work what have you learned about life and what have you learned about yourself okay well as i mentioned i am you know at my heart a skeptical journalist so i've learned to let that go because i've witnessed thousands of miracles I mean, I've been bombarded with miracles, essentially. And I've started realizing that I always knew there was a new type of science, but I've also now recognized there is a new type of human, or at least it's, it's an old type of human and we're finally just recognizing it, that we have the capacity to heal ourselves, each other, and the world. And so we need to just relearn how to do that. And that's become 
my work, essentially, trying to help people do that. Do you feel that you're you're guided in your work? Oh, yeah. I think this got gifted to me. As I said, I bumped into it by accident. I was just trying to test how intention works. Suddenly saw, and I was far from convinced the intention experiment was going to work. And I thought, oh, well, maybe we'll get a tiny little effect. And I didn't expect 36 out of 40 mm -hmm. to show a big effects. But what has been the most amazing to me is watching what happens to people after taking part in small and large group intention, they get changed. And so for me, I think it was, I, I feel like the gatekeeper to this, that I've set, I got gifted with a capacity humans have, and that I have to be a careful guardian of it because I don't want it to be misused but I need to tell the world about it because it is an extraordinary mechanism for healing. Um, when people do power of eight groups or intention experiments together, and let's say they're polarized communities, like not long ago, a few years ago, I did one with both Arabs and Israelis, mm -hmm. not speaking to each other before, to, you know, uh, Arabs from about eight different <clears throat> Arab cities we had cameras in their rooms and the ninth one in an auditorium of Israeli Jews. By the end of it, this is just 10 minutes, they were sending love to each other. They were saying, your God is my God. I, again, we have this on video. Now that's happened over and over again with polarized communities. So I've recognized that this group intention, something about an altruistic act in a group seems to open up the heart and enable it to leap across the fence. So it's important to use this for the good. Last question. Um, is this, do you think frequency plays a major role in this? Um, this sounds a little bit, and I'm not comparing, but like the upper room where you deal with Paul Selig, his guides talk, talk to us about you're in the upper room and it's a place where fear can't exist. And so anything can happen. Um, and it can happen very quickly. Uh, you just never, you never know. Um, so in your groups, do you feel that the tipping point there is the frequency of people, they kind of get on the same level and it's a, it's a very high light level where they're all kind of in the same, vibing the same way, if you will, and things can happen uh, as the field works where it doesn't have to be about the constrictions of time, competition and limitations. Well, I'm not a, I'm not uh, familiar with the upper room idea, which is it sounds fascinating to me. What I do know is when people have the same thought, it's like guitarists playing together. They've measured brain waves, and within seconds, they their brain waves are operating in synchrony. There's no doubt a synchron a synchrony that happens in a group holding on to the same intention at the same moment. Um, I think we do enter that altered state and that is, and that's been clear, that's been demonstrated in our brainwave studies. And in that state, that is one reason why we have this capacity to heal. We are in a state of oneness. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the big secret sauces here. Fantastic. Lynn McTaggart, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. I have about a thousand more questions, but hopefully we can do it again at some point. I know you're super busy, but tell everybody where they can find out more about you. I'm going to join one of your Power 8 uh, great groups, and I'm going to tell our audience about that, and I'll reach out to you also. But um, tell, tell everybody where they can learn more about you, Lynn. Okay. Well, you can join me at lynnmctaggart.com, and I have an array of courses. I have the Intention Experiment. Everybody can join the intention experiment for free. We're running ongoing intentions for Israel and Gaza at the moment. And you can experience for yourself how altering that is, how healing that is, and how opening that is to just take part in those 10-minute experiments. And I'm running my iconic Power of Eight Intention Masterclass. It kicks off February 17th. I teach you live and interactive for six 
successive um, sessions and then put you in groups of eight or so. And we, I work with you for a whole year and you've got your group to work with for a whole year. So if you're hankering for a power of eight group, this is an easy way to do it. Awesome. And for the master class, do you have to take any classes before then? No, you can take that if you want to join. That is level two. If you want to find out a little bit more, we have a, we have a short um, course that is a, um, that is bite-sized bits Got that it. you can, and it's recorded. So you can Fantastic. buy that before you take it. Fantastic. Lynn McTaggart, keep doing the work you're doing. You're, I, I'm not into heroes, but you're a hero because the work you're doing is making a better planet. And it's something I think men can relate to and need to start to learn more about that we can be better. And people like you are shining a light and leading the way. So thank you so much for the work you're doing and for being on Guys Guys Radio. And I hope you'll come back. Thank you so much. And I do want to say one member of my groups who was a guy um, at the end of a year said to me, this was during lockdown, mm -hmm. I've had more love from my group than I've ever experienced in my life. Wow. I now know what love is. And I think that is that big opening of the heart kind of said it all. Fantastic. I love it. Thank you so much, Lynn. We'll see you again and uh, talk to you soon. Be well. Thank you. You too. Thank you. If you enjoy the guests and content I bring you each and every week, the Guys Guys TV and Guys Guys Radio, please support us by subscribing to our channels and platforms. Thank you.